husband, Russell, is an artist. And I am May, and I have an interest in true crime. We decided to merge our two interests together. Enjoy this calming visual while listening to a tragic story. This is Stuart and Crime. Warning, this episode contains some violent crimes. Listener discretion is advised. It was 1984. A man was sitting in the courtroom at his arraignment for a double murder. When he turned and asked the judge what they should do about the other 100 women he'd killed. All shocked by this response, life became a circus in police departments all over America, all because of the confessions of Henry Lee Lucas. He confessed to killing a woman in Texas on August 8, 1970. Her name was Linda Jane Phillips, a 26-year-old school teacher who had left a party that night but never made it to her parents' house. Her body was found two days later. She had been sexually assaulted and sustained 26 stab wounds. Kaufman County DA William Conrad fully believed him based on this quote from Lucas. There are just some things so terrible that you can't forget them. Henry Lee Lucas pleaded guilty to her murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Police believed this to be his first murder of at least 60 victims in Texas. And the murder confessions just kept on rolling out of his mouth. Police departments from all over were eager to talk to Lucas on the many cold cases they had open to see if they could close some. Turns out, they could close a lot or at least they felt satisfied enough to close them. This went on for a year and a half of officers asking if he committed specific murders and Lucas responding, yes, and giving details on the crimes. Though his confessions began becoming more far-fetched, but he was already sentenced to death for another murder, so why not talk? This specific murder was of a woman who had been referred to as Orange Socks. This name was given to her as it was the only clothing found on her body when she was discovered on October 31, 1979. She had been strangled to death. Lucas told authorities he picked up Orange Socks up in Oklahoma, killed her along the interstate, and dumped her in the ditch in which she was found. His confession seemed to match up with a small piece of physical evidence, a matchbook, traced back to a hotel in Oklahoma. Lucas had even pointed out a culvert drainage ditch near the one she was found in. So they charged him with her murder and he was sentenced to death for this crime. Her true identity was found out in 2019 to be that of Deborah Jackson, 23, of Abilene. The police put out an updated sketch of the unknown woman, and her sister saw the image, called the police, and told them she believed that sketch looked like her missing sister. This was later confirmed. Now that Lucas was sentenced to death, he might as well own up to all his murders. After all, he was getting a lot of attention, notoriety, and getting to go on trips to identify murder locations. In one of those trips, retired Texas Ranger Glenn Elliott said, I remember him trying to cop to one he didn't do. But there was another murder case, where I'll kiss your butt if he didn't lead us right to the deer stand where the murder took place. Ain't no way he could have guessed that. And I dang sure didn't tell him. I think he did that one. An investigator from Delaware went to question Lucas about an unsolved murder of a young woman. He showed Lucas a photo of the crime scene and of the woman's bedroom. Lucas confessed he had killed her, and when he was shown a picture of the victim with her family, he correctly identified her, convincing the investigator 
he was the murderer. Another murder confession the police believed was the 1981 murder of 18-year-old Diana Bryant. She was babysitting on April 26 when she was strangled with a vacuum cleaner cord. The two children she was watching were thankfully in the other room. Lucas pled guilty to this murder and was sentenced to 75 years. Lucas was also charged in the murder of 26-year-old Catherine Gill of Georgia. She was found in a heavily wooded area, shot to death on October 15, 1981. Police said he led them right to where her body was found. Henry Lee Lucas was becoming known as the most prolific serial killer to have ever existed, and he was enjoying his time spent out of jail, talking to investigators, eating fast food, and drinking strawberry milkshakes. The Texas Rangers became involved when Lucas started all these confessions, and two Rangers were picked to operate the Henry Lee Lucas Task Force. Investigators from across the country traveled to Georgetown to talk to Lucas. The Rangers also flew with him to California, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and other jurisdictions. Out of all the murders he was confessing to, Lucas somehow left behind no evidence, no proof he was there, but would shock investigators when he could remember minute details about the crime scenes. Thanks to this task force, they were able to close 229 murder cases from over 26 police agencies. Lucas confessed to over 600 murderers. But was he the serial killer who was able to murder all over the country without leaving any evidence? Or was he the greatest con man who was able to trick investigators whom seemed more interested in closing cases than to figure out if he was the true killer. In 1985, things started to unravel for Lucas. Not from investigators, but from reporters. Taken from an article in the Houston Chronicle, it explains, By meticulously cross-checking Lucas's confessions with his court documents, work papers, rental receipts, jail rosters, and other records, reporters found that Lucas probably did not commit all these murders. The following information is taken from a 1985 article from D Magazine called Profile of a Killer by Nan Cuba and Dr. Joel Norris. Because of the above claims, Nan Cuba and Dr. Joel Norris flew Lucas to Dallas on January 28, 1985 for an all-day series of neurological tests and examinations. They concluded that Lucas fits the neurological, sociological, and biochemical blueprint of a serial murderer. According to the Norris Serial Killer Profile, serial murderers are defined as often having an average or above-average IQ, are approximately 28 years of age, and either in solitude with a partner, or sometimes in families or cults. Go trolling the pedestrian byways, driven by an insatiable compulsion to slaughter people they usually have never met. Potentially creative people, most are viewed by their neighbors as pleasant, sometimes charming, and many are avid media fans and police buffs. They are almost all drug abusers and have an unhealthy reaction to alcohol. Few have ever been married or have children. Most have memory problems and, as a result, are often caught telling lies, which causes ambiguity and frustration for those who are trying to understand them. They have compulsive personalities, keeping scrapbooks, diaries, or souvenirs of the murders while also racking up high car mileage as they continually cruise potential murder sites. This information, along with the test results, led Cuba and Norris to believe and write, Lucas could be, probably is, a murderer of many people. 
we were not surprised by Lucas when he recanted his confessions or that they were coerced and that he stated he really killed no one. Again, he was conforming to the dictates of the moment. And that it was tragic that his survival instincts and memory problems will likely make it impossible ever to know for sure the number of strangers he actually murdered. Below this article in D Magazine is a rebuttal by the writers who were the first to question Lucas's stories. This was titled Profile of a Con Man by Hugh A. Ainsworth and Jim Henderson. Starting off the article with the following. Cuba and Norris said their work is an attempt to stimulate research into the serial killer phenomenon. And we are asked to comment on their theories and conclusions. They go on to explain in the article that if Lucas was a serial killer, he's a very minor one, as there has not been a single shred of court-worthy evidence that Lucas has killed more than three people. Hugh and Jim believe that the leap of logic Cuba and Norris offer is troubling, because Lucas may fit some aspects of the serial killer profile, and because he has certain brain abnormalities, he must, therefore, be a serial killer. Lucas does not fit much of the profile. He does not have an average or above average IQ. He is well beyond 28 years of age. He has no history of being an avid media fan or a police buff. He has been married and does not appear to have a memory problem. Lawmen have described his memory as phenomenal. His personality is anything but compulsive. He kept no diaries, no souvenirs of his alleged crimes. Millions of Americans fit the serial killer profile, as well as Lucas. Yet, they are not serial killers. Actually, let's go back to what we do know to be true about Henry Lee Lucas. He was born in Blacksburg, Virginia in 1936. He grew up in a one-room log cabin in a very abusive household. The only man he knew as his father was a man named Anderson, but more commonly known by his nickname, No Legs. He had lost his legs in a tragic workplace accident by a railroad. And unable to work, he started making and selling alcohol out of the home. He was also an alcoholic. But the true abuser of the household was his mother, Viola, a prostitute who was also an alcoholic. Lucas was the youngest of nine children, but only he, his brother, and parents lived in the house at that time. When he was eight years old, his mother hit him so hard with a wooden two-by-four plank to the head that he was in a coma for three days. Lucas said later, I hated all my life. I hated everybody. When I first grew up and can remember, I was dressed as a girl by my mother, and I stayed that way for two or three years. And after that, I was treated like what I call the dog of the family. I was beaten. I was made to do things that no human being would want to do. She also made him, his brother, and father watch her have sex with other men. At 10 years old, Lucas got into a fight with his brother and sustained an injury to his left eye. But Viola waited for days to get it checked out. It became infected and had to be removed. At this time, he was already close to being an alcoholic himself and was disgustingly introduced to bestiality by his uncle. Anderson Lucas passed away in 1949 after passing out drunk in a blizzard and dying of hypothermia. In 1951, Lucas received his first prison sentence after he and two of his half-brothers were arrested for burglary. He spent a year in a school for juvenile delinquents. Then in June of 1954, he was sentenced to six years for 12 counts of burglary. He tried to escape twice during this time and then ended up being released in 1959. He then moved in with his sister in Michigan. 
but Viola wanted her son to come home and to take care of her. This resulted in the mother and son getting into a heated argument in 1960. Lucas was 23 at the time and got so angry when his mother slapped him that he slapped her right back. But when she fell to the ground and he saw all the blood, he realized that he had a knife in his hand and had slashed her across the throat, which in turn caused her to have a heart attack that was fatal. And although he claimed it was self-defense, he was found guilty of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison. Lucas only served 10 years of this sentence before being released in June 1970 due to prison overcrowding. But after attempting to kidnap a young girl, he was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. He moved to Pennsylvania after being released and worked at a mushroom farm. He married a woman named Betty Crawford in 1975. But he left her when she accused him of molesting her two daughters. At this time, he was described as being a drifter, working odd jobs around the country, when he met Otis Toole in 1976. They met at a soup kitchen and soon became lovers and moved in together. The two actually had a lot in common, as their upbringings were quite similar. Both grew up in abusive homes and had mothers who had dressed them up as girls, and both were murderers. By the time they met, Toole was already a serial arsonist and a suspect in four murders, with his first victim being a traveling salesman who tried to pick him up for sex in the early 1960s. He was 14 at the time of this murder. But sadly, the star-crossed murderer's relationship didn't last. When Lucas moved in with Toole, Becky Powell, Toole's young niece with intellectual disabilities, also lived there. Lucas fell in love with the girl, and they eventually ran off and left Toole behind. 15-year-old Becky became Henry Lee Lucas's common law wife. In Texas, the two of them moved in with an 82-year-old woman named Kate Rich. She became their landlord, and Lucas started working for her. But the couple ended up getting kicked out by Kate's neighbors after it was found out they had been cashing checks in her name. They next moved into a shack at a Pentecostal commune called the House of Prayer, where Lucas was hired as a roofer. But they were only there for a brief time, as everything changed on August 24, 1982, when Lucas and Becky drove to a field in Denton, Texas. They got into an argument, and Lucas stabbed Becky with a butcher knife, later testifying. I sat next to her corpse and talked to her about trying to figure out what to do with her body and ended up dismembering her body because it was the only thing I could think of. I'm not going to deny I'm responsible for taking her life. There's just things that happen in my life that I can't explain. Three weeks later, on September 16th, Lucas convinced his previous landlord, Kate Rich, to come and help him look for Becky. He drove to a camping ground in Ringgold, Texas, killed the woman, and stuffed her body into a drainage pipe. For the next month, he began drifting around, but ended up back at House of Prayer. This is where he learned he was suspected in Kate Rich's disappearance. So he went and retrieved her body, took it back to House of Prayer, and incinerated her in a stove. A year went by before Lucas was arrested, but it wasn't for murder. It was for illegal firearm possession on June 11, 1983. While in prison, he ended up confessing to the two murders, and these two confessions led to physical evidence of pieces of bone fragments and the remains of Becky. Four days after being in jail, he pled guilty to the two murders, and this is also where he said the famous line that turned police departments upside down. This was also the starting point of the con man making everyone believe 
he was the most prolific serial killer. Otis Toole was arrested in Florida in 1984 on charges of burning a 64-year-old man alive. The killer couple were now both behind bars. Toole seemed to keep his mouth shut while Lucas jabbered on more and more. Except for one big case that Tool decided to confess to. That was the murder of six-year-old Adam Walsh. On July 27, 1981, Adam had been abducted from a mall in Florida where he was with his mom shopping at the time. She had allowed him to stay in a part of the store where some older boys were playing video games so that he could watch while she did some shopping nearby. But a security guard told the older boys they were being too loud and were asked to leave. It is assumed that Adam, who was a shy boy, followed the other boys out of the store instead of informing the guard his mother was there shopping. It is presumed that he was abducted outside the Sears store. His parents launched a massive search for their son. Sadly, on August 10, 1981, two fishermen in a drainage canal in Vero Beach, Florida, about 100 miles from where he was abducted, found the severed head of Adam Walsh. His body was never recovered. Even when Toole confessed to the crime and described where his body was buried, the police were never able to locate the boy's remains. And with no physical evidence, the state was unable to prosecute him for the crime. Several months later, Toole recanted his confession, but over the years, he would repeatedly confess to the boy's murder and then take it back. Otis Toole died in prison in 1996. In December 2008, the Florida police announced they believed they had a strong enough case against Toole to close the investigation into Adam Walsh's death. His father, John Walsh, became an advocate for crime victims after this tragedy, and in 1984, he founded the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And in 1988, he began hosting the TV show, America's Most Wanted. In 2006, George W. Bush signed the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act into law, which created a national database of convicted child sex offenders, strengthened federal penalties for crimes against children, and provided funding and training for law enforcement to fight crimes involving the sexual exploitation of children via the internet. While in jail, Lucas and Toole shared another similarity, both recanting their confessions. Lucas would later admit confessing to crimes won him extra privileges. The police would drive him out to the scene of the crime and even let him get fast food on the way. For a man who had already been sentenced to death row, confessing to murder upon murder was just a way to spend some time outside. Lucas later boasted, I made the police look stupid. I was out to wreck Texas law enforcement. But how was this man able to convince so many trained law enforcement officers into believing his stories if he didn't really commit all these crimes? According to that same article in D Magazine, tape recordings of many of his confessions show that Lucas was able to discern details of crimes from innocuous questions and revise details if he sensed he was not telling investigators what they wanted to hear. Lucas had learned to be quite cunning in the way he lived in the world. For example, remember earlier when Lucas was shown a picture of the crime scene and the teenager's room and then was able to point her out in a family photo? Later, Lucas admitted that he had faked the confession. How was he able to pick the victim out of the group photograph? He picked the one wearing glasses. How did he know the victim wore glasses? In the crime scene, he was shown initially there was a pair of glasses on the nightstand beside the bed. But nothing he told to police had been kept secret from the public. Or, which was later found out, that investigators gave him more information and cases to help with his confessions. 
After it all, Lucas was found guilty of nine murders in Texas, including the death sentence he got for the murder of Deborah Jackson, Orange Sox. Lucas also recanted this confession, and six days before his scheduled execution in 1998, then-Governor George W. Bush commuted the death sentence, citing a lack of evidence connecting Lucas to the murder, marking the first and only time Bush did so as a governor. Lucas spent the rest of his life in prison and died in 2001. Families who had once believed their loved ones were taken by the serial killer are now demanding the cases to be reopened. What I've been believing all these years was Henry did it. There's not one shred of evidence to show that Lucas killed my mother, says the family member of one of the women Lucas confessed to murdering. In the last 20 years, DNA evidence has proved that in at least 20 cases, Lucas confessed to were proven not to be his murder victims. Many still believe in the disturbed fantasy of this horrific serial killer when only three, Viola Lucas, Becky Powell, and Kate Rich, are the only 100% factually known victims of Henry Lee Lucas. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button below. If you want to inquire about a commission, you can email Russell at russellstuart.art at gmail.com. You can watch Russell live stream his art on Twitch. And if you want to hear more true crime stories, you can subscribe to my podcast, Crimes of a Decade, a Texas true crime podcast. Now that we are done, make sure to wash the brush. Just beat the devil out of it.